three, two, one. Roll right up right track way. Perfect right. shoot, he scores! Mike check four. Number two, number two RL. Three, 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 take three. Ready Kevin four, stay with the defender. 30 blue. Ready, Ready four. Way back to the wall after all. That ball is out of here. Oh, sucker. Have a good one, everybody. Shooting the score is brought to you by Hall Pass Media and Hall Pass Studios. Hall Pass Media is a full service marketing agency that specializes in brand consulting, event management, digital marketing, and creative design. Hall Pass Media has a wide range of clients and partners that include the NBA Summer League, NBA Coaches Association, and the Basketball Tournament, to name a few. For more information, please visit hallpassnetwork.com. Hello and welcome all you sports creatives to the Shooting to Score podcast. Today's episode, we're going to talk about network television. I'm sure for most of us growing up, ESPN was the dream job. Well, today I get to talk to a special guest who actually attained her dream job. Her name is Crystal Nungarai, and she's a producer for the NFL Network, where she's been for the last nine seasons. Crystal and I have a long, long history together as we came up in broadcasting and cut our teeth together in in the early high school and college days. So this conversation was very, very special for me. I hope you gain as much insight out of it as I did. So without further ado, here's Crystal Nungarai. Cool. Thanks for joining me, Crystal. <laughs> so happy to be here, Max. This and, uh, is kind of deja vu. A little throwback. Excited <laughs> to be sitting down here with you. Yeah. So, it's fun to, to connect with you again. We go back. We go way back. Way back. Um, both of us got our got our start and our roots go back uh, back a long ways, back to Carlsbad. Um, but before we get into that, I want I want you to start off um, just telling people uh, who you are and, and uh, what, do you, what do you do now? Absolutely. Um, my name is Crystal Nungarai, and I am a producer at the NFL Network. Uh, this is my ninth season, um, and I do everything from edit coordinating to script writing to highlight producing, um, being out in the field with sit-down interviews, and then seeing post-production um, in the edit bays. So. Any show that you've seen on NFL Network, I have touched in some capacity over the last nine seasons. Nine seasons you've been there? Yes. Um, I mean, I guess we'll start out just how'd you get involved with uh, NFL Network? So my senior year of college um, at Chapman University, I wanted to intern with the NFL Network. And luckily, it was only like an hour drive away, which to both of us, Mm -hmm. if you live in Southern California, you're used to commuting. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the, the... the opportunity to work for The Shield um, was always my goal. And so I started as an intern and it was the most tedious job. I would log shot by shot, frame by frame, what they would call the week in review, which was just like a compilation of the best of uh, Mm -hmm. that they would get from films. And it would take me about 10 hours a week to go through this hour and five hour and 10 minute reel of the best and then you know send that out to all the producers just so they knew the best shots the best sound in house so i started as an intern and uh kept showing up after my semester was over as an intern um and stayed through the super bowl stayed through the combine stayed through the draft and then finally they were like okay you have to go home we don't have any more work for you um but that was my senior year so they called me like a week before graduation and they said we're launching a brand new morning show come in for an interview and I've been there ever since. Nice. So I guess now I want to go back, um, back to where we started. But uh, how'd you get get your start in the television media world? Yeah, um, we were both fortunate to grow up in Carlsbad, California, where student broadcasting is like mm-hmm. in our blood. It's in our backyard. <laughs> um, and this amazing teacher, uh, Doug Green, started programs like vms tv and ao tv mm-hmm. and um i kind of got into it late it's so competitive now i didn't start until my sophomore year mm-hmm. of high school um and that's of course where we met right but this little program called chs tv or carlsbad high school television um gave me the start that's awesome um so transition you know you knew obviously you after high school this was a career path that you wanted to take uh you got into chapman and decided to go there do you remember when you, you know, either were leaving Carlsbad or first seven, seven foot on campus at Chapman, what kind of your dreams and aspirations were at that point? I definitely at that point thought I was going to be an on-air personality. I was like, I'm going to be an anchor. As you know, you were always my cameraman and I was the reporter. Um, but the reality of moving to small town Nebraska or middle of nowhere Arizona, 
leaving my Southern California bubble quickly shifted my aspirations elsewhere. And I always had a heart for the NFL, Mm -hmm. not necessarily sports. I'm kind of a one trick pony. I love the NFL. But when we start talking about like tennis and golf, I can really only pay attention to the major tournaments. Um, so that's kind of when I shifted towards sports and, but we were still required to take all the different aspects in, Mm -hmm. in college. And, um, also just the grind of daily news, like, cause coming up through CHS TV, we all kind of thought that there was just news television. Mm -hmm. There wasn't sports, there wasn't entertainment, there wasn't documentary. Um, but you know, there's a lot of heavy news happening and I didn't want to be the person to have to deliver tough news to your living room. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was like, okay, sports is something that everybody can identify with and everybody loves and it's lighthearted. And at the end of the day, it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So kind of trended towards that by the end of my senior year. So you said it was pretty much football or nothing. Why, why did you have such a passion for the game? Uh, I grew up with, uh, my mom is one of nine and she has six brothers. So, There was only one TV when she grew up and it was always on football. And so naturally when, you know, ever since I was a baby, football was just always on in our household. And I'm the kind of person that I like to do things that I'm good at. And I already knew football. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I'm just going to stick with football. Right. Um, And so I grew up with so many uncles and cousins who played football Mm -hmm. and in my family, if you want to be able to say anything at the Thanksgiving dinner table, (laughs) you better know your stuff. Yeah. So I started, you know, reading newspapers because we didn't have like, I didn't have the internet to just Google or Yahoo Sports wasn't a thing then. Mm -hmm. So Sunday reading the back of newspapers um, just to keep up with the boys and the conversation and memorizing, you know, I remember being like middle school, memorizing the divisions and the head coaches and just trying to be cool like the boys. (laughs) And then uh, I guess fast forward through Chapman and it seemed like the vision from being on air shifted a little bit, but, um, you know, you kind of, have, you were pretty focused as much as I've seen of anybody at that age, uh, of being able to work for, as you said, the shield. Um, what do you think set you apart or what do you think, um, did you learn both about yourself and kind of about where your career was headed during your internship time, um, at NFL network, uh, during your senior year, um, that especially led to you getting that job interview? I think, um, Well, uh, I was lucky because I had a lot of great people notice me and reach out to me. I was a little bit timid and I just wanted to keep my head down and get my work done. And I was afraid to ask anybody anything, but I had great people like Steve Weich, Bobby Cartwright, uh, Michael Berger, who took me under their wing and were like, what do you want to do? Introduce me to the edit bays, showed me what a rundown was, showed me the stages and just kind of expanded that. And I was willing to do anything. I was willing to talk to anybody. I was willing to stay super late. And I think it was just that willingness. Um, also God, right time, right place. Right. right? Um, yeah, that kind of just set me apart at least early. And then Mm -hmm. it was, it was being willing to take that first job because our first show NFL AM we were a morning show set on the West Coast. There are no national morning shows set on the West Coast for a very obvious reason, mm-hmm. and it's that nobody wants to get up and work the graveyard shift. Mm-hmm. You know, Good Morning America is set on the East Coast for a reason. Mm-hmm. So we were going on th- at 3 a.m., and I did the overnight shift for four years, going into work at 8 p.m., getting off work at 4 a.m., not sleeping during the day, just laying in bed listening to the trash guy come by and people mowing their lawns. I did that for four years and that was probably the The quickest way that I was able to climb up the ladder because I was willing to do what a lot of people aren't willing to do. Totally. Um, And then talk about um, for a second just your progression at NFL Network where you, you know, what your role was when you started um, and then kind of uh, how it's grown from there. For sure. So after my intern year and I was hired um, as a production assistant for NFL AM, I was supposed to do teleprompter, but I never touched the teleprompter. I still haven't. Um, If someone put me in front of the teleprompter, I mean, I'm sure I could figure out, but I never prompted a day. Um, The person that was supposed to be producing the show open fell through, got fired. I don't know the details, but I was thrown in there and they said, cut the show open. And I had never even seen our video system before I just kind of fumbled through it and you know I didn't write the script at the time just got the script found the best footage found the music found the sound bites and that was kind of my baby for the first year two years was doing the show open and the super tease eventually I got to write the show open and the super tease 
Um, and that was kind of my specialty. And so I did the morning show for, yeah, about four seasons. And then I switched over to Dayside and worked on shows like Total Access. Um, and that entailed me being an edit coordinator, um, managing several, like anywhere from three to seven edit bays at a time, overseeing editors, overseeing projects, getting press conferences in, putting together music videos, just kind of managing the daily side of um, post-production. Um, and then being able to write for Total Access, writing the scripts for talent. Um, you know, those teases that you get right before you go to commercial, mm -hmm. make sure you stick around. Why Jimmy Graham might not be the best fit at tight end this week. And of course, there's only three options for tight end this week, but you're going to stick around now because I just gave you some nugget that that guy might not be the one to start. Mm -hmm. um, so that was um, fun, stressful, super stressful because I just doubted myself so much. I was like, I'm the person writing what they're <laughs> saying on the National Football League TV show right, right now. Like it just, it felt surreal. Um, after I did that, I touched on Game Day Live, Game Day Morning as an EBS producer, and now I am a features producer. Um, and this past season was my first season, and I did Thursday Night Football, which was a blast. When you say you did Thursday Night Football, I mean, what does that mean? So our, our pre-show um, on the network, any video content that you saw that wasn't our talking heads, that mm -hmm. wasn't Colleen Wolf, Michael Irvin on the stage, was produced by me and my team. So that was the show opens, super teases, music videos. That was sit downs with mm -hmm. Cooper Cup or J.J. Watt, whoever it may be. Um, and that was all me and my team grinding it out from Monday at 10 a.m. when we looked at the matchups and figured out what we wanted to do and to delivering it to the trucks out in location, um, you know, Thursday right before kickoff. Sweet. Um, so you talked about a lot of stuff there that I kind of want to touch on, but um, kind of going back a little bit, um, what are some life skills that you think you have that is, have really helped you in your job? Um, you know, and, and maybe, maybe you found those out um, or have grown in those, you know, once, since you started there. For sure. Um, I think you, well, I think I am very outgoing, very mm -hmm. outspoken. I'm um, not afraid to pitch ideas and have them be shot down. And I think that goes in any industry you're at. You just have to find the confidence to articulate and verbalize whatever's going on in your head and spit it out there. And nine out of 10 times, it's not going to be received. But that one out of 10 times when it is received, you know, the sky is the limit. And getting the green light of, yes, that's a great story idea. That's a great segment idea. Let's do it it feels like you're bringing something to the team. So being able to speak up and articulate, um, being able to network and multitask and how to handle a hostile environment. I feel like if you're trying to enter media, TV, live TV, and then probably the gnarliest of all live sports television, you have to have a thick skin. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have to be willing for people to go off the handle on you because we're live on air. And sometimes it feels like we're doing open heart surgery and all chaos will hit the control room. And, um, you know, you just kind of have to walk away at the end of the day being like, it was just a TV show. Nobody died. Right. It's okay. We flew the wrong topic bar. We ran the wrong tape. Nobody at home noticed just mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. So having a thick skin, being able to speak up, multitask, organized, you know, all the things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. And then I want to ask you a little bit about stuff that, that, you know, I geek out about and that's all the tech stuff. Um, what are some of the applications, um, softwares, uh, programs and stuff that you use on a day-to-day -day basis or that you've used during your time there from, you know, edited softwares to, you mentioned EVS. Um, what, what, what are all those like, what are all those? For sure. So, uh, we use ENPS. Um, if you're not familiar, it's probably the equivalent of iNews. So make sure you know how to use a show rundown. Um, make sure you're super familiar with Microsoft Office. No matter what you want to do, if you, there's an opportunity for you to take an Excel class and Excel spreadsheets, just do it. It'll make your life so much easier. Um, EBS playback, we use Fork Production for playout and playback, being able to see all the footage and all the tapes that we've cut, being able to see all the raw footage. Uh, we operate off Adobe Premiere. Mm -hmm. And um, Final Cut was what was the thing when I walked in the building, and that was what we grew up on. 
old Final Cut Pro, but I feel like it's ancient and nobody uses mm-hmm. Final Cut Pro anymore. Or at least the kind that we used. It's it's changed. Final Cut X is a completely different software, so it's uh... no. And um, and I feel like I've seen editors go from mouse editing to keyboard editing now to editing with like a pencil. It's this crazy like and like instead of you know they're just using the pencil instead mm-hmm. of the mouse, which. I don't spend too much time in the edit systems anymore, um, but we have something called a beatbot machine, which does a lot of really cool RT effects and can make a, a normal piece of video look like we spent hours on it, which we probably did unnecessarily. Um, but yeah, I mean, you walk on our stages, we've got lights for days, cameras for days, mm. Um, a lot of equipment that I'm not allowed to touch, the steady cams, all that yeah. fun stuff. I mean, is it overwhelming for you if you know for stuff that you aren't necessarily familiar with or whatever that you're walking around, or is it just kind of become commonplace now? It's definitely common. I feel like I can walk around that place with my mm-hmm. eyes closed now. Um, but you know, it's welcoming and it doesn't feel scary. But you and I have grown up around this mm-hmm. stuff. We've been we've spent two thirds of our life around yeah. it now. Um, but what's cool is everybody's willing to. I feel like everybody in my experience is willing to share whatever mm-hmm. they know. So I feel like I do spend that time with the graphics people and I'm like, how does this viz op work? Like, so you're the BA, but you're not actually flying the graphics. Your viz op is flying mm-hmm. the graphics. And you know, they love to ask me like, how does the process of writing a script go through the edit bay? And like, how are we the ones rolling this tape? So, um, I think that's probably true in most work environments, right? Is Everyone has their specialty, mm-hmm. but you can learn so much from the person sitting across from you in a different department as long as you're willing to spend some time and ask some questions. Mm-hmm. How has kind of the industry or the, I guess, your network changed um, in your tenure there? You know, you've been there for quite a while now. I'm sure it's gone through its fair share of ups and downs. Yeah, we have grown so much. When I first mm-hmm. started, we were we were sharing the property with like three or four other businesses Mm -hmm. um, that were not related to media or the NFL network at all. And slowly, one by one, as soon as our leases are over, we just snatch up the space um, and we grow and we grow. And now we're going to be moving to the new stadium um, in Inglewood, SoFi Stadium. So that's really exciting. Um, What about like, I mean, maybe you touch on competitiveness of getting the job mm -hmm. or, um, you know, trends of creative storytelling. I mean, I'm sure all of that has, has you've seen it fluctuate over the years and had to adjust. Yeah. Well now social media has been an element, right? Like Mm -hmm. I was leaving college and we were like taking Twitter 101. Like, Mm -hmm. what is this? We had no idea how much social media was going to blow up. And now talk about competitiveness. We have not only are you competing against kids who are students, young professionals who went to school for broadcasting, but who went to school for social media and they can do everything that you thought you could do in an edit bay on their phones. Mm -hmm. And they can say, look, we can cut together the best highlights on our phones and put them on Instagram stories. And, you know, that's a whole nother beast in itself, Mm -hmm. even just integrating social media into a daily show on TV, um, is, is huge. And a big obstacle that the NFL has had to overcome as has any successful, Mm -hmm. not just media, but company or brand. Um, so that's been something to navigate social media. Um, and what else did you team me up on? You had something else that was pretty good there. Um, I got to think back now. No, um, cre- I mean, creative brands creative. and then, you know, just the competitiveness of, of working for the NFL network. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that since, you know, you started and the network's grown that more and more people want to work for it and it's made the job, you know, harder to get and harder to keep. It is. And it almost keeps you, there's a lot of times where I find myself frustrated or overwhelmed or like, you know what, like I'm just going to quit or I want to demand a higher pay raise or I want to mm-hmm. demand this or that. And there's, you have to know, like in the back of your mind too, like everyone's kind of dispensable mm-hmm. and you can demand all you want, but you know that there's a stack of resumes ready to go. And there are people that are willing to just get in their foot, their foot in the door at the NFL network and do mm-hmm. anything solely because it's the shield solely. Next to nothing as well right. Too. Yeah. Right. And uh, you know, there, that's a, I think a, a decision a lot of people have to make early in their careers is like, do I want to move to Bristol, Connecticut and work for pennies and work for ESPN, you know, or do I want to do anything at the NFL network or do I want to start at a, smaller media company where maybe I have more opportunity for growth and more opportunity to be hands-on. I think that that's something that you can get blinded by so quickly. It's like, I just want to work for ESPN. I just Mm -hmm. want to work for MLB network, whatever the big brand name is. Mm -hmm. 
that might not always be the best opportunity. Well, and talk about that. They're like smaller media companies. Do you guys use outside media companies um, to produce some of your other, some of your packages and features? I mean, in 30, you guys have essentially territories in 30 different cities around the country. Absolutely. So, I mean, on the daily show side where I've spent, I mean, eight of my last nine seasons, uh, I didn't see anything being outsourced. But now that I'm on the features team, we hire plenty of small eight, 10 person production companies, production houses to handle our one-on-one shoots with Tom Brady in New England if we mm-hmm. can't get it out there. And we know that they're gonna produce it well, they're gonna film it where, well, they'll be able to color and mix it, turn it back to us right. in the 36 hour timeline mm-hmm. that we need it in. Um, and those are very valuable to us. Mm-hmm. And I feel like those media productions, I want more opportunities with those companies. Right. Those are the creme de la creme. Well, and they, it's because they, spe- you know, they specialize in in those features and that you know that creative storytelling process and those people. That's what they do, you know, on the day to day is is that um, you know specialized creative creative feature stuff. But um, how how closely do you guys work with teams too? Because I mean, most teams have their own media departments. Yeah, I mean, uh, all of our reporters, we have like beat reporters, Mm -hmm. right? So you'll see um, Omar Ruiz will always be like with the Niners or the Raiders. Same with MJ Acosta. Um, Tiffany Blackman will always be in the South. Jane Slater will always be with the Cowboys. And so we have very close um, connections and relationships with all the teams, especially their PR departments, right? Right. Because if they have a locker room speech, Mm -hmm. it has to be cleared before we run it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if Jerry says something that he doesn't want on TV, they have to clear it. Uh, but they also have all of their own uh, TV. I mean, if you think about when you go to a game and all of the like promos that you see mm-hmm. of the players before mm-hmm. they run out of the tunnel right, or right. the don't drink and drive promos, that's all done by the team. Right. Um, some teams are awesome. Like shout out to the Ravens. They send us tons of specialty footage that they shot, they produce, they spend the money for. And why not? Right. Mm-hmm. Like let's get it to a wider audience. Mm-hmm. Um, but it varies across the league. It's not like we have um, each team has an A plus or the same cookie cutter like right. media team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the Ravens, and like I've definitely heard of them because you know things that I follow online. Like, what are some kind of resources that you use um, to grow and to to stay up on on the industry? Um, I'm lucky that we have this amazing um, research team and we have this amazing news desk and I get about an email a minute um, knowing telling me that Tom Brady just had strawberries for breakfast or that he sneezed or that JJ Watt is out you know mowing the lawn Mm -hmm. whatever it is I almost know too much and I don't really have to look too far um, because it's all right there anything that's relevant and what's Mm -hmm. great is I know it's reliable I don't get anything in my news box until it's been like vetted vetted confirmed right people will hit me up like this past weekend Julian Edelman was arrested and I didn't know. I mean, they were hitting me up hours before it even hit my inbox because we hadn't vetted it yet and hadn't been approved. So, but I mean, everybody's looking at pro football talk. Everyone's watching. I mean, I watch ESPN. Right. I know ESPN's watching us. Right. Um, you know, news alerts on your phone. It's it's not hard. I mean, I could walk, I could walk away from my desk, walk down to the cafeteria, get something to eat, and if anything happens in that seven minute walk, I'll hear about it because mm-hmm. it, we've got TVs everywhere, right. people are talking about it, people's phones are going crazy, so it's kind of hard to escape it. Outside of NFL news, though, I mean, for sports broadcasting, do you stay up on on trends and technology, or anything like that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so consumed, like I said, in um the, in the NFL the topic, world. Yeah. And, um, I'm a, I'm a one trick pony and I mean, I watch sports center every once in a while to see what's going on mm-hmm. with basketball and baseball, but go Padres, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> which would tell you why I don't really care that much about baseball because I'm a Padre fan. Hey now, hey now. <laughs> um, that's, that's our only hometown team. So we got, we got to take know, it easy. I know, I know, I know, I uh, know, but we won't go there. <laughs> um, I guess talk about a little bit about working with talent. I mean, you get to be around some pretty high profile people with your job. Um, what's that like? And yeah, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, on a daily basis, I'm working with guys like, you know, Kurt Warner, Steve Mariucci, LaDainian Tomlinson, Terrell Davis, James Jones, Maurice Jones, Drew, Willie McGinnis. I mean, all these Super Bowl Hall of Famers, um, now it's cool to the point where it doesn't really feel like I'm starstruck by them. Mm-hmm. The guys that I do get starstruck by um, usually comes when I'm out working for CBS Sports. And it's not so much the players. It's 
usually the broadcasting team, like getting to work with Greg Gumbel, or uh, I got to spend the day with Dick Enberg at his home, you know, just like 18 months before he passed away. And he pulled out all of his old game cards, these huge like half poster boards where he would, you know, the Super Bowl, the last Super Bowl he called 1998 Packers, Broncos, and you see under number seven, Elway. And he's got all of his notes and all of his tidbits. And he wow. was just showing me all these historic games. That guy called everything from baseball to the Olympics to football to like horse racing. Um, so just kind of that access and just kind of getting to pick his brain. Same with Al Michaels. I just met him recently. And I felt like it wasn't real. I felt like the TV was on in my, like, mm -hmm. right next to me. And these guys, like, I asked him about the World Series during the earthquake. Mm -hmm. And he remembers it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, my favorite part about working with CBS is um, working with Jim Nance and Tony Romo. I mean, as soon as CBS announced that they signed Tony Romo, mm -hmm. I remember running to the schedule and seeing when are they coming to LA? Because obviously they only cover the A game, right? Yeah. So it was a week 11 game. It was the Rams and the Saints at the Coliseum. Those two teams were battling it out week 11. I'm sure the records were great at that point. And um, I made sure that I was going to be working that game <laughs> and that I was going to be in the booth for that game. And Jim is the nicest person you will ever meet. It's such a big heart for people. And Tony is so excited about the game, like just as excited as he comes off, mm -hmm. like he's for real that excited. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like being in an NFL locker room when you're getting ready for a game with him because he's singing at the top of his lungs, like just getting just getting hyped. We're all excited. Um, so that's a really fun aspect and just it doesn't feel real because millions of people want to right. meet these people. And sometimes right. I'm like, why am I the one here <laughs> hanging out with them? Or why mm -hmm. am I the one like talking through game points with them? It just, I don't know. I feel really lucky. Yeah. So you got to be in the booth with those guys. I mean, what were you, what, what were your you know responsibilities for that game? So, I mean, when you're with the A crew mm -hmm. um, and you're in the booth with them, I'm not going to lie and pretend like I was telling Tony Romo what to say. Right. Um, those guys are very self-sufficient and mm -hmm. do not need any of my help. Usually <laughs> I just end up being their um, escort yeah. person where they have their friends and family coming through, mm -hmm. um, which is great because Chad Michael Murray is part of Tony Romo's friends and family that come through. So <laughs> getting to escort him around isn't a bad job. Um, but normally when I work with CBS, if I'm not in the booth, you know, hanging out with Tony Romo's a-list celebrity friends. Um, I'm down on the field working with Evan Washburn or Tracy Wolfson. And again, they're incredibly talented. They right. don't need me. But what ends up happening is I go on the other opposite sideline. She'll take the home. I'll take the visitor. And we're doing like injury reports, right? Because right. we always... So sometimes it's like, okay, Crystal, what do you see? So-and-so just went off the field. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they're looking at his left knee. It looks right. like... And this was all before the blue tent. Now we can't tell yeah. what the heck's going on because we got the blue tent down there. Mm. Um, injury reports, um, the post game interviews, right? We're, somehow we're always right there with mm. the with the star player, you know, coordinating the camera, the lights, getting with the PR people, making sure that we're gonna get Philip Rivers right. after he throws that fourth quarter touchdown, which is dating Philip Rivers because he hasn't thrown that fourth yeah. quarter game winning <laughs> touchdown in a while. But yeah, that's awesome. Um, we want to talk a little bit more about, you know, these big name people and, and these incredible opportunities that you've had to, to be around some of your heroes. You know, what do you take away from that at the end of the day, um, whether it's just something that's personal gratification or something that helps you grow, um, you know, as a person or, or in your career? They're all super humble and just real people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what encourages me to just be super real mm -hmm. and stay grounded. Not that I have anything to be up in the clouds about, but um they're really passionate about it and they work hard. Everyone thinks it's so easy to just go on screen and go on camera and talk about football. They spend hours preparing and anything you watch on TV, a 30 second trailer, promo, whatever it is, that took hours to put together. Mm -hmm. And the world of TV and sports TV is definitely a craft and it's a skill and it's not something that you just wake up one day and can do. Like it takes practice. It takes um, patience. It takes discipline and knowledge. And I just respect someone like Al Michaels so much. He's just like, but he, he's a student of the game. Right? right. And so whatever I think your profession is, is you have to kind of approach it as you're never done learning. You're never done growing. You always want to keep 
studying. And mm. it's almost like we have to put that into our schedules of like, you know, Wednesdays from two to four, I'm going to study a craft. I'm going to hone in on a skill that I want to be better on, whether mm. it's, you know, in our world, it would be audio, graphics, right. camera, whatever your weakness is, because that's what's going to make you more valuable mm -hmm. um, and just more well-rounded. Mm -hmm. How have you gotten to learn more about the game during your time at NFL Network, the X's and O's side about that? Because um, you've mentioned that sounds like it's a pretty important part, even just as much, if not more so, than you know the technical aspect of, of broadcasting. For sure. Um, I mean, a lot of it was sitting in our talent meetings. We're going through the show rundowns, and we asked the guys, you know, like, how are you going to attack this game plan? And they would, you know, they talk about zone coverage, man coverage, you know, like why Bill Belichick lines up this way or mm -hmm. so a lot of it was just for me sitting up and shutting up and listening, right. which is hard for me. <laughs> I love to talk um, and just acknowledging that I don't know it all, you know, using programs like next gen stats. And it's really it's not hard if you just even if you're just watching an NFL game, we're pretty good about telling you what's happening mm -hmm. and you can follow what's going on. And, you know, when we do exos, um, it's really simple to pay attention. I mean, I read a lot of books too. If you read like Tony Dungy's book, Tom, T Tim Tebow's book, Drew Brees' book, any of those guys that put out books, a lot of them love to talk X's and O's. Um, and once you can spot zone coverage, once you can spot who's lining up on one right. side, it's really easy to point out. So if you want to be a student of the game, um, really just watch yeah. <laughs> and pay attention. Yeah. Listen to what Tony Romo is saying because right. he's changed the game, mm -hmm. right? He's going to he's gonna tell you what the coverage is right. before the ball is even snapped. Mm -hmm. So now we have someone telling you and then you see it play out right, right in front of you. It's like the best way to learn the game. And it's live. It's not like you're going back and watching a replay. It's you no. know, live and it's engaging. He's right nine out yeah. of ten times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, it's awesome, and he, yeah, obviously he's a he's a big fan favorite, and uh, and you know obviously this week it's pretty um, you know top of the headlines for new contracts and stuff like that. Um, going back into your studio, I mean, what's been one of your favorite experiences uh, working Game Day Live? Yeah, so last season NFL Game Day Live was probably the most stressful role I have ever had at the network mm -hmm. and everyone knows what red zone is right all the football fantasy fantasy football people are watching red zone well mm -hmm. if you turn on NFL network on a Sunday for seven hours straight we're doing game day live which red zone is just what's happening within the 20 yard line mm -hmm. and nothing else you don't see any of the failed drives well game day live is all the drives the complete story and essentially there are three producers and I was one of them and we're on and you have anywhere from in the morning, nine, 10 morning games. And there's three of us. Right. So essentially I have three morning games and I have one EVS operator and I am in charge of cutting together the storyline, not just the highlights, but making sure you at home understand what is happening in all three of these games simultaneously while it's happening live. So you're getting a broadcast feed and you have a, essentially a replay operator that can roll back and take the clips. Yes. But well, we're doing three games at once, and I've got a producer yelling at me in my ear, we're coming to you, do you have the play? And so with the games kick off, and you know there was probably a 35-yard return in my first game, there's probably a 15-yard um, epic one-handed reception in my second game, and then you know a minute later there was probably a great fumble or touchdown in my third game. This is all happening at once, and I have to decide how to tell the story, right? Because right? it's easy to just cue up the touchdown and roll it. But right. Give me the story of the drive. Was it three and out that led to that, you right. know, like epic, you know, kickoff return? Was it, um, of course, I just, I just faced. But was it, you know, was it an epic, was right. it a great crafted drive by Joe Flacco? That's dated. Is it a, a Derrick Henry, you know, three awesome runs? You know, what was it that got us that so that it makes sense? And also if two, if a team goes three and out back to back, I can't show that without showing what happened with the other team in between those two series. Right. Because when you're just watching, you're not hearing it because our talent is narrating it for you. So not only am I having one producer yell at me in my ear, we're coming to you right now, but I have to tell Rhett Lewis or, or whoever our talent is, is it was a first and five to Brady to Gronk. Of course, I'm thinking of my last season, but um, it was high stress, high energy. We didn't leave for seven hours there was no eating there was no going to the bathroom there was no breathing um 
and then of course there was always some epic play by some guy who's not on like the top like roster so you're scrambling through your sheets to try and figure out who that person right. was and of course they have some ridiculously hard name to pronounce and you have to figure out how to pronounce it mm -hmm. um and then sometimes there's this, we're always watching these games too without any sound right because i don't have another ear to listen to my producer and the talent and right. talk to my so if there's some insane pi call or some weird flag or something right we have to be able to communicate that to the talent. And so that's where it came in of like, you have to know what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, it was so stressful. It was really fun, really stressful. I learned so much, um, but it got to the point where I would just like black out and I would get home and I'd be watching Sunday Night Football and you know their halftime show for Sunday Night Football. They're doing the best 60 seconds of the mm -hmm. day. And I'd be watching and be like, oh, the Texans beat the Colts. Not, but the Texans Colts game would have been one of my right. games that morning, but I just completely <laughs> forgot was, what happened in yeah. that game. So uh, it was, but, but again, I'm so glad I put myself in that situation. It was uncomfortable. I wasn't sleeping Saturday nights before because I was so stressed or I was just trying to research the game, mm -hmm. but putting yourself in that position, putting myself in that position to grow, um, it was definitely worth it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a, I mean, Great story, um, and you know, great experience for you. You've got an, some other great experiences even before NFL Network. Can you talk about some of your memorable experiences that maybe uh, encouraged you to to take a career in broadcasting? Um, CHS TV and a Chapman. Yeah. Um, so CHS TV, we it was a daily show in high school. I take great pride in us being able in a bunch of what? How old were we in high school? Like when we're sophomores, we were what, like 14, 14 15. 15 yeah. And putting out a daily eight minute show with complete, with a show open and a director and packages. Um, and I, that's kind of when I started noticing that I wanted to do sports. And we had a teacher who said, well, let's throw you on the sports desk. Mm -hmm. And CHS TV at the time had kind of had this, like for the previous year or two, this mission of interviewing Tiger Woods, like and we're the hunt, the search for Tiger, the mm -hmm. hunt for Tiger. And I remember Mr. Green called me and he was like, tomorrow we're going to go to the Accenture golf tournament mm -hmm. and Tiger Woods is playing at La Costa. And I was like, what? And I was like, mom, I don't have anything to wear. <laughs> and so we went and we bought my first blazer and we showed up and, you know, Mr. Green and I had this big plastic camera, just like all plastic. Uh -huh. you know, they don't even make them like that uh -huh. anymore. I don't even, I don't know if it shot on mini DV or what it was shooting on. It might've been the, I don't think it was a beta tape, but uh, and we're set up and there's the golf channel and there's ESPN and there's all the local affiliates. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was a free for all. It was going to be his press conference. And that's when the adrenaline kicked in. And that's when the, Oh, the fear in the pit of my stomach. Um, because if you don't speak up, you're not going to get your question. And so it probably felt like eternity to me of all these reporters asking these questions. Um, and I just finally was like, if I don't say anything, I'm not going to get my chance. And so I just <laughs> screamed like tiger. And he just looked right at me. And I said, I thank God I had questions in my bat, in my head, ready to go because I would have just blown it. But I was like, um, are you sad about the Accenture leaving La Costa? And you know, he answered my question. I don't remember what he said or any of that, but I just, <laughs> at that moment I was like, I can do this. Yeah. I love the pressure, mm -hmm. I love the adrenaline. And I think if you work in live TV sports, you have to be a little bit of an adrenaline junkie because anything can go wrong at any given moment. Like mm -hmm. we've been live on the air during an earthquake before in Los Angeles, in Southern California, like you kind of have to be prepared. Like, what are you gonna do? And of course, all of us just keep working because right. we're like, <laughs> it'll pass. Um, but there's just this unknown X factor. And I think we all kind of like it that at any kind of any given moment, like anything could happen. Mm -hmm. the, the power could go out. The game could go into triple overtime. You know, the star could go down. The star could make the play of the century. Like we don't know. It's just this like X factor the whole time. And I think that's kind of what drew me to sports TV is I was just like, I love the adrenaline. I love the unknown. And I just love being a part of something so much bigger than myself. Yeah. So where do you see, um, you know, your career headed? What are, what's the uh, end goal or what are the aspirations? Do you want to get back in front of the camera? <laughs> I don't know. Again, I'm not trying to move to Minnesota or something far away. Um, I do still do some on-air stuff, not for the NFL Network, uh, for my church. Shout out to North Coast Calvary Chapel in Carlsbad, California. Um, 
I, I think what's great is that I don't know what's next. I just know I want to learn as much as possible. And I think I've been pretty good in my career about taking chances and going in directions that I didn't think I would go before and just trying to touch as many different aspects of TV as possible. And going from the daily show grind for eight years to now original content um, in the features world is a completely different pace. And it's rewarding in a different kind of way. And I think just not being complacent and that's where you see people grow, right? Because it's easy to stay in the same position for 10 years, 15 mm-hmm. years, forever. Um, but I also like always wanted to work for the NFL. That was my dream. Never did I think I would achieve it right out of college. Right. So sometimes I ask myself, okay, like what's beyond this dream? Mm-hmm. But I think it will in some capacity always include the NFL. It will always include storytelling because I've got a passion for both. That's awesome. Um, so you talked a lot about the good and the glitz and the glamour, but <laughs> yeah. what's, what's one thing that you're struggling with right now? Um, I think what everybody needs to know in going into sports media is that there are no holidays, there are no weekends, there are no nine to five positions. If you want to work in sports, it is a grueling grinding schedule because think about it when you're at home with your families on Thanksgiving, you're watching football. Mm -hmm. Christmas, you're watching basketball. And that means that you are out in the field, you're out in the control room, you're bringing that to people in their homes. And it's, hey, it's great your first year, it's great your first four years. After that, it gets a little old and it gets a little grinding. And you know, people wanna get married in the fall and I'm like, I can't tell you how many weddings I've had to either pull all nighters for or miss because you know, your career is just something that is super demanding. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was something that was forewarned to me too, is one of the executives my, that I met my, when I was an intern was like, you're going to miss a lot of funerals, weddings, birthday parties, because this is a grinding schedule. Mm-hmm. And it is tough. It's a big sacrifice. It's a big sacrifice. There is, like I said, there is no like go in at nine, clock out at five, because it's 24 hour news operation. Right. So long days, um, unpredictable schedules that I think is definitely not on the glitz and glam part of working for the NFL. Totally. Um, what's one thing that working, um, that, you know, you can convey to the people that you work with or someone that holds that position, um, that makes working with you easier, basically position that makes work that they can do that makes working with a producer easier. Oh, okay. Um, If they're a type A producer like me, (laughs) honestly, I think just come with your ideas, come prepared, right? Mm -hmm. So even if you show up with 10 bad ideas, that's better than showing up with nothing. Um, Be willing to do anything. You might be super skilled at camera and one day I might want to throw you on the air or vice versa. You might be super skilled in audio and I'm like, well, I want to throw you in graphics kind of Mm -hmm. thing. Um, and just, if you're someone who's out there right now, like with your hands on a camera, spend all the time you can filming everything you can in all different aspects. Um, you know, single cam, multi-cam, uh, documentary, uh, news, one man bandit as much as you can. And I feel like people are getting away from that, but that's where the real value is. And that's where people like you find your success because you know how to do it all and you weren't afraid to touch it all. And sometimes it can feel overwhelming because you're like, well, Something to me, like uh, being a producer at graphics seems daunting, but spend some time doing it. It's mm-hmm. really not that bad. That's awesome. Well, we're starting to run, run towards our end here, towards the end here. Um, and I've gotten to pick your brain uh, just about <laughs> as, as much as I could here. Is there anything else that you want to add? Uh, no, I think, um, gosh, I am super grateful to work for the NFL. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really fun. It's as much as there are highs and lows, um, it's the dream job for sure. At least it's the dream job for me. Yeah. And uh, anybody out there that wants to do it, do it. Try. There's, there's, just reach out to anybody that you know that can point you in the right direction. I've had tons of college students, high school students, even people older than me reach out and say, can we grab a cup of coffee? Can, mm-hmm. you know, can we have a phone call? Just to encourage them because you never want to think like, what if? Mm-hmm. And I think what I've seen the most in this industry is people are willing to talk. People are willing to help you out. People are willing to answer emails or, you know, meet you where you're at and kind of help you 
pave your way. And I think the only reason you're where you are and I'm where I am is because people did the same for us. Totally. Great, uh, great soundbite, great advice to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it, Crystal. Thanks for joining me today. Awesome, Max. Good to see you. Thanks for listening, and I hope you learned something that you didn't know before. You can find Crystal on social at Crystal Nungarai. That's K-R-Y-S-T-A-L-N-U-N-G-A-R-A-Y. Feel free to give her a follow if you like what you heard or are inspired by anything that was said today. For those of you just getting started or trying to advance in your career, I can't recommend the powers of social media enough. It connects you to thousands if not millions of people around the world that can help you. And with that, I'll say so long and we'll see you next time.